In our chapter for these last two weeks, titled Looking at Jesus' Actions from the Garden of Gethsemane to the Cross, we learned how our lovely Lord Jesus responded over and over again with what we've been learning about. Long-suffering, gentleness, or kindness, and goodness. And it was so aptly brought out, did you notice in those chapters how it didn't matter who the person was, whether it was the man whose ear was cut off, whether it was Judas, it didn't matter. The Lord always acted by the rule of the Spirit. However, we're going to learn today of the Galatian believers to whom the book of Galatians was written, that that isn't the way they responded all the time. Not like the Lord Jesus responded. You'll remember in our opening um, lesson, we gave a background kind of Galatians, and the first four chapters, Paul deals with Believers that wanted to go back and be in bondage to the law again. But in Galatians 5.1, if you'll go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Galatians, we'll look at a few verses to begin with here, there. Paul says in 5.1, Stand fast in the liberty where we, wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. One of the commentators said, liberty or freedom always presents an opposite temptation from legalism or keeping the law to be saved. Because we can begin to view liberty as a selfish opportunity to do just what we want to do. Liberty does not give us the freedom to treat others wrongly. What does liberty give us freedom to do? Well, you'll notice in Galatians 5.13, it tells us what this freedom gives us to do. You have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but what? What, what are we to do with it? But by love, serve one another. That's what he's talking about in this book, loving each other. As we look at all the do's and don'ts, and the rules of the Old Testament. Have you ever wondered how anybody could keep all those? <laughs> but do you know in Galatians here, he tells us the way to do it, to keep every single one. Notice Galatians 5.14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. In other words, you'll comply with the entire law. How do we do it? What does it say? You'll love your neighbor as yourself. To serve one another in love, serve one another, means to be slaves of one another. Now, the pastor has been hitting that in Mark, hasn't he? over and over again, were to be slaves to, to one another is what this word means. We can do this only when we love Christ and others more than we love ourselves. So liberty does not give us the freedom to quarrel and to engage in conflict. Several factions probably existed in the Galatian church like they had in Corinth. You remember how many factions they had? In Galatian, some of them would have followed Paul, probably. 
many of them would have followed the Judaizers, and what were those? Those were people who said that to be a good Christian, you first had to be a good Jew. In other words, you had to follow for salvation the law of Moses and accepting Christ. They mixed the two. That's what a Judaizer was. And there was a faction in Galatia of Gentile believers. They had come to Christ. They probably had this idea, my liberty gives me the freedom to do whatever I want to do. But all those factions didn't have the love they needed for one another. And notice what this lack of love did. Look at verse 15 of Galatians 5. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. The word bite is primarily used of snakes and animals. It's in close connection here with the word devour, which means to gulp down. So a commentator said, almost certainly this reference is to savage half-wild dogs that you would see roaming the streets. They just let them run loose because they took care of the refuse and, and the garbage and all that. Another translation says, if you go on fighting one another tooth and nail, which is like a cat fight. Have you ever seen one? Ladies, that's what the explanation of what these people in Galatia were doing. They were having a cat fight. And notice the words there, you'll be consumed. The idea is you'll be annihilated. It's often used of destruction by fire. The basic idea seems to be nothing at all will remain after you're done. And one of the commentators brought up the idea, you may have heard of the old fable from the days of Cromwell about two cats from Ireland, Kilkenny, Ireland, who fought each other so ferociously that only their tails remained at the end of the fight. <laughs> and so back in that day, the simile... It came to mean any conflict that was likely to ruin both combatants. And that's what he's saying here. You'll be consumed. It'll ruin everybody when you bite and devour one another. And it's interesting that Paul goes on when he lists the work of the flesh, beginning here in 5 verse 19, I'd like you to notice how many of them are antithetical to long-suffering goodness and kindness. Notice, notice what he says. Works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Notice the word hatred. The idea is enmity or hostile feelings. The word variance, strife, contentiousness, discord, emulations, which means jealousy, wrath, outbursts of anger, or temper tantrums. Strife means selfishness or disputes, canvassing for position, seditions, dissensions, or divisions heresies, factions with particular opinions, and envy. Those are works of the flesh that he specifically lists. Galatians 5.26 also goes on to exhort these people. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another or challenging one another and envying one one another. Evidently, there were personal problems. There were conflicts in this church. 
at Galatia. They were not walking by the rule of the Spirit. Notice the definite statement he makes in verse 16. How do we know that these people in Galatia were not walking in the Spirit? It tells us in verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you what? shall not or will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Therefore, ladies, the converse must be true. When I am biting and devouring, when I am in conflict, the obvious conclusion is I am not walking by the rule of the Spirit. So you see the connection of how we get the fruit of the Spirit in this passage. These people needed to know what walking in the Spirit looked like. The Lord led me in our lesson today. It was a short chapter. I didn't think it needed any further explanation. So I'm going to deal with today dealing with conflict. How do we define it? What causes it is what I'd like to start with this morning. We all at one time or another have probably been in conflict ourselves, or at the very least, we know people probably presently who are in conflict. There's a classic work written by Ken Sandy. It's called The Peacemaker. A Biblical Guide to Resolving Personal Conflict. He defines conflict as a difference in opinion or purpose that frustrates someone's goals or desires. And he lists four primary causes of conflict in his opinion. Number one, misunderstandings that result from poor communication. And he brings our attention to the book of Joshua. You'll remember in that day that there were 12 tribes of Israel. And the two and a half tribes asked if they could settle on one side of the Jordan. Do you remember the story? And Moses said, yes, you can if you go back and help the 10 tribes take their portion of their inheritance. So they did that. So when all the land was conquered, all the tribes were ready to settle in. These two and a half tribes were heading back to their inheritance. Before they crossed the Jordan, they built this huge altar. And when word got back to the ten tribes, they came uncorked because they said, Don't you realize that God has said, this is the way sacrifices are to be made. This is where they're to be made. You're going to bring down God's judgment on all of us, just like it came down on Achan and Peor. You can read the, the section in there. And those two and a half tribes says, now, whoa, 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 whoa. You're misunderstanding what we're doing here. They said, we are making this altar as a witness, not to, to sacrifice on, but he said, they said, when our descendants in years to come, they say, we have no part with the other tribes. We want this altar to be a witness between us that, yes, you do have a part with the other tribes. Yes, we do worship the same God. So you see the misunderstanding just from poor communication caused a terrible conflict. They were going to go to war with the two and a half tribes. Another primary cause of conflict is differences in values, goals, gifts, callings, priorities, expectations, interests, or opinions. That about covers it all, doesn't it? <laughs> He gives the example of Acts 15, remember, between Barnabas and Paul. 
Barnabas was determined to take Mark with him and Paul on a preaching trip, and Paul didn't think it was such a good idea because Mark had left once before. The contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other, or they parted company. Now, do you think that both Paul and Barnabas were good spiritual men? Yeah. So conflict can happen to good men and good women if we're not careful. A third reason for conflict, competition over limited resources like time or money. And the example he gave here was in Genesis. Do you remember the strife that developed between the herdsmen of Lot and the herdsmen of Abraham? Because there were limited space, spaces, resources there. And so strife developed, and you remember the story, Abraham and Lot had to go different directions. Unfortunately, Lot chose the wrong direction. The fourth reason, sinful attitudes and habits that lead to sinful words and actions. I'd like you to turn to James 4. There's a very familiar verse here <clears throat> in light of this uh, con conflict problem. James asked the question in verse 1, from whence or where come wars and fighting among you? In other words, what's the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Notice where they come even of your lusts that war in your members, or our desires is another word for lust. Notice, if you would read on down, what happens when our, what our desires can lead to. We become jealous. We covet what other people have. When our desires go unfulfilled, we become hateful, which God says is murder in his sight. We become envious, we cannot obtain, so we fight and we quarrel. And he ends this passage by saying, if we do ask God to give us our desires, we often do it with the wrong motive, so that we can consume it on our desires. I'd also like to bring out the conflict besides these four that Sandy mentions. I think there are some other uh, sources of conflict. Self-centeredness is one. We look out for our interests first, naturally, do we not? And Isaiah 53, 6, I'd like to call your attention to a few words. You know the verse well. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one what? To his own way. The essence of sin, ladies, is self-centeredness, wanting my way. Another cause of conflict is pride because we are convinced of the rightness of our position. I remember when one of our sons was two, we were visiting Grandma and Grandpa Miller in Colorado, and they have a tapestry. If you would come to my house now, you would see it. It's about this big. It's of a moose in the wild. And when our son was a little boy, he was playing with one of his aunts there, and she pointed out to him on that tapestry do you see the moose? Deer. He thought it was a deer. No, it's a moose, she said. Deer. <laughs> Do you think that two-year-old could be convinced of the wrongness of his position? <laughs> he was two. And... Uh, do you remember the verse in the Bible, Proverbs 13 says that only by pride comes contention. 
I'd also like to think about you to think about this source of conflict, our unrealistic expectations. Because when, un, uh, when expectations are unfulfilled, this can cause us to be disillusioned, fall into self-pity. This past summer in July, Tony and I were gone for about two weeks to New Zealand. And I have some relatives there who, when I was a girl, some of them came to visit us in Colorado. I wanted to find them. It was a great answer to prayer. I did. I met with two of them. The Lord had them in the same town we were. But I had a relative, Heinrich, who was my great, great uncle, immigrated to New Zealand. Three of the brothers from Germany came to the U.S., one stayed in Germany. Now, what if our common ancestor over there, he was a gold miner, by the way. He was wealthy, by the way. And let's pretend that when I went over and visited my relatives, that they were so glad to see their long-lost cousin because Heinrich had left something in his will for any descendants that could be found of his brothers in the U.S. Now, this is a pretend scenario, okay? <laughs> so, in my mind, I begin to imagine, I begin to expect, Uncle Heinrich was such a wealthy man. I bet he left me about $10,000. That would be about right, wouldn't it? And so the day arrives that I get the check in the mail, and it's $500. Now, what has my expectation done to me and my thoughts of Uncle Heinrich? What a skin flint! But you see what our expectations can do to us. I give you four reasons here why exp expectations are problematic. First of all, desires are not verbalized. In other words, we don't tell people generally what our desires are. We just have this idea, well, they ought to know. They should have known. People will not be able to read our minds, ladies. There's a verse that my husband and I had for our wedding verse in Ephesians 4.15. It says, but speaking the truth in love. People will not be able to read our minds. And at our expectations, most of the time, are right here. We never let people know what we expect. Another problem with expectations is they turn into demands. And we think, to be happy, I must have this from that person. Whether it's gratitude or respect or fairness or friendliness or helpfulness or understanding or that my husband remembers our anniversary. <laughs> to be happy, I must have this. Jesus gave up every right he had to everything, Philippians 2 tells us. <coughs> Another problem with expectations is personal gain is a motivating factor. It always is, because I will be benefited in some way when that person fulfills my expectation. And Philippians 2, 3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory or selfishness or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, humility. Let's, let each esteem others better than themselves or regard each other as more important. And I think the biggest problem with expectations is our happiness and contentment are based over things on which we have no control. And that's others' behavior. 
We have no control, ladies, over others' behavior. And yet so often when we expect things, our happiness just goes chunk. We have no control over that. There's a verse I'd like to call your attention to in Psalm 62, 5. It says, My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation or hope is from him. Another source of conflict is a log in our own eye. You remember the verse, don't you, where the Bible asks the questions, well, why do you want to remove the speck in your brother's eye when you have a beam in your own? And another thing that I would like to um, mention is personal chemistry. And someone else brought this out. We do not like others at times because they seem too much like us. We often do not like in others what we do not like in ourselves. I'd like you to think about that one. These are some sources of conflict. What are some natural fleshly inclinations that we have? that we just go to when we get into conflict. Well, the first thing we do is we try to escape it. And most of us in this room, being Christian ladies who try to be controlled by the Spirit, that's probably what we go to first. So, what are some escape mechanisms that we employ in trying to escape? First of all, we ignore the conflict or just deny that it exists. We pretend it's not there. Everything's okay, uh, whether it is or not. You remember 1 Samuel tells us about the priest Eli, about he heard about his sinful sons and how they were lying with the women who served in the temple. Did Eli do a thing about it? No, he just ignored the problem. And it eventually grew so big that Eli lost his entire kingdom. You'll remember the prophecies there. You can read that story. To ignore the existence of conflict allows it to build up and worsen over time. And generally when that happens, somebody eventually blows up. Another escape mechanism as, is we run away. And turning to alcohol, drugs, opioids, this is a form of flight. And it also may include leaving the house, ending a friendship, quitting a job, filing for divorce, changing churches. But is running away a good solution to conflict? No, because it only postpones a problem. You remember the story of Hagar and Sarah? After Ishmael was born, Sarah got really tough with Hagar. And she fled into the desert. Do you remember the story? Did that do anything to solve the problem? Not a bit. And I'm not going to take time to read that passage, but if you could read that, you'll see God told Hagar to go back. And there are three things that I think the Lord showed Hagar to do. She went back with a submissive spirit in verse 9. She held tight to the promises of God, verse 10. And she believed that God had heard her prayers of misery, verse 11. So I challenge you to read how God instructed Hagar to handle that. Now, at times, you may need a cooling off period. All of us do to calm down, to pray, to confess any sin in our own life, but the idea of, of letting the sun go down on your wrath is not you extend a long, long period of time to wait to handle something. 
because then it turns into bitterness. And a second time when it's okay to run, anyone facing physical abuse or the threat of it should flee. Did David stick around when Saul threw a javelin at him? No. He got out of there, and it also says, that night David made good his escape. So I want to put those two qualifiers in under runaway. Another escape mechanism is to lose all hope and to give in to despair. Because severe depression and suicide are escape mechanisms. You'll remember the story of Elijah. And again, I'm not going to go into that, but he was physically and emotionally weary under the threat of death from Queen Jezebel. And when he was under that pressure, he requested that he could die. And if you would read there, he was afraid of the future. Verse 3, he felt worthless. Verse 4, he felt overwhelmed. Verse 7, he felt alone. Verse 10, he felt that his life hadn't counted for anything. Verse 10, and he felt rejected. And every one of those things, ladies, are part of a suicide mentality. Another way to escape are that we try to respond in a fleshly way, is we compete. This is the person that looks at conflict as a contest of wills that must be won. We have strong convictions. Mine are right, of course. <laughs> and we begin looking at the other side as enemies or opponents. Have you ever looked at somebody like that? Perhaps a Christian brother. Competitors would rather win than find the best solution or preserve a relationship. Another fleshly inclination is we go into attack mode. We shout, accuse, name call, slander, intimidate, damage a reputation, or sometimes physical force comes into play. Acts 16 tells us, or Acts 6 tells us of Stephen, and it said his opponents, those certain men in the synagogue who opposed him and his message of Christ, says they weren't able to resist the wisdom and the power by which Stephen spoke. So what did they do? They started slandering. They brought in false witnesses. They persuaded men to vote against him in the Sanhedrin, and you eventually know what happened. They stoned him. Another way to uh, have a fleshly response is just to blame the other person. And I'm going back to the story of Sarah and Abraham. You remember it was Sarah's idea when, the, when they didn't have an heir. She says, well, why don't you take Hagar as your secondary wife? So Abraham did, and it says that when Hagar became pregnant, Sarah blamed Abraham. And she said in Genesis 16, you're responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. Go read it. That's what she told him. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between me and you. My mom used to tell me, perhaps you've heard this old saying, it takes two to tango. Now, I don't mean tangle. I mean tango. And that, the idea is a tango is an old dance, I guess. I don't know. I looked it up. But the idea is it takes two to fight. Ladies generally in conflict at both parties can partially both be at fault. Rarely do you find a fight 
where both are not in some part responsible. We each approach conflict with a particular mindset. To some, it's a hazard that threatens to sweep them off their feet and leave them bruised and hurting. To others, it's an obstacle that they should conquer quickly and firmly regardless of the consequences. Ken Sandy said, the Bible teaches that we should see conflict neither as an inconvenience nor as an occasion to force our will on others, but rather as an opportunity to demonstrate the love and power of God in our lives. You see, ladies, whether conflict arises from perhaps a personal preference issue or something far more serious, we've got to realize that conflict is not the problem. It's the handling of the conflict that's a problem. It's how we manage the conflict that's the problem, not the conflict itself. Ken Sandy goes on to say, could we look at conflict as a stewarding opportunity? A management opportunity? What does a steward do? He doesn't manage things for his own pleasure, convenience, or benefit. Instead, he follows the master's instructions to look out for the master's interests. And he says, whenever you are involved in conflict, God has given you a management opportunity because he's empowered you through the gospel, entrusted you with abilities, entrusted you with his word and spiritual resources. And he said, we need to look at conflict as an opportunity. So... Conflict, we've seen different sources. We've seen how we handle it in a fleshly way so often. How can we be a peacemaker? A maintainer and a maker of peace. You remember the verse in Matthew 5, 9, and I'd like to define the words as I read through. Blessed, enjoying enviable Enviable happiness, spiritually prosperous, are the peacemakers, the makers and maintainers of peace, for they shall be called the sons of God. Ladies, the Bible tells us we have been reconciled to God. What does that word reconciled mean? The dictionary has the idea of friendship being reestablished and a dispute that is settled. Isn't that what we've been talking about? We as believers have been reconciled to God, and it says in Romans 5, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the commentator said, the peace receivers have now become peace diffusers. God is thus seen reflected in them, and by the family likeness, these peacemakers are recognized as the children of God. So what are some biblical things we can do to make and maintain peace? First of all, initiate reconciliation. That is a hard, hard thing to do. But Matthew 5 instructs us that that's what we're to do. He said, when you remember, if you have a grievance or a complaint against anyone, and the scene is interesting because it takes us to the moment when that Israelite had in his hands his peace offering with God 
and he is standing at the rail there that divided the co different courts in the temple. And it was at there, that very moment that he was ready to transfer that peace offering, offering to the priest who's standing right there where he's going to gain forgiveness with God and he remembers, uh-oh, somebody has something against me. He's ready to get God's forgiveness right then. And he remembers. Do you remember what it says you're to do? You're to leave your offering right there. And you're to go and make it right. Mark, in his gospel, expands on this commandment to be reconciled. He says, you have a spirit of forgiveness. And when you stand praying, it's very similar to Matthew's scene. And when you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Remember that phrase in the Lord's Prayer? Ladies, many people today, and this is my personal belief, that many are depressed, mentally ill, and bipolar because of prolonged anger or the sun going down on their wrath, which is a definition of bitterness. <coughs> Do you remember the story of the two servants where one begged the other for forgiveness. He owed just a teeny bit. And the other guy said, no, I am not going to forgive you. Remember that story? And it says at the end of that that he will be turned over to the tormentors. If we hang on to bitterness, there's some kind of torment that's going to come with that if we're unforgiving. You see, because it tells us in Ephesians that when we're bitter, what does a, when we give a place to the devil, what does that mean? It means we give him a base of operation. Another thing we can biblical, biblically do, we do good and show mercy. And the definition of mercy there means sympathy, tenderness, responsiveness, and compassion. Because the question is asked, if you do good to them who do good to you, what thank have you? Sinners do that. But love your enemies and your war reward will be great. And you shall be children of the highest, for he's kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father in heaven is merciful. Another biblical mandate is control your tongue. You remember what James talks about? He says, we all stumble and fail and offend in so many things, but he says, if you don't offend in speech, you're able to control your whole body, your entire nature. And he said, you're a perfect man. In other words, you're a mature person if you can do that. Another way that Biblically, we can maintain peace is bear the offender's burdens by seeking to restore him or her. And this brings us back to Galatians. You remember in Galatians 6 how the passage goes on into this? It says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted, bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. 
So instead of biting and devouring one another, being conceited and challenging and provoking one another, he said, this is what you're to do. You're to restore. You're to bear others' burdens. The original word restore signifies to set in joint as a dislocated bone. Now, those of you who are medical people maybe know what that's like. But that's the idea of the word. Do you appreciate a rough doctor setting a, a dislocated bone? No. And that's the idea here. He said it needs to be done with gentleness, with compassion, and without an attitude of superiority. The things that are listed from here on are just some other practical things that we can do to make and maintain peace, to be a peacemaker. Listen carefully. Give others the opportunity to express their feelings and the problem as they see it without you interrupting or becoming judgmental. Does that mean you have to agree with them? No, but they have the right to express their opinion. Secondly, you ask questions and rephrase what you're hearing to help clarify the other's meaning. This is where I get into trouble most of the time. And I think most of us would sit, even with our spouses, would say this is true. Do you know that spouses have a totally different vocabulary and definitions of things? <laughs> they can say one word, you can say another word, and you have in your mind what they meant, and that may not be what they meant at all. That's why this is so important, because we often misinterpret. When you ask questions in a conflict, don't, they say, don't ask questions that can be answered with just a yes or no. Because they answer yes, and the discussion's done. <laughs> Neither use why questions, because that causes defensiveness. Try to be objective rather than emotional. Now, ladies, this is hard for us because we have a tendency as women, the way we were made, to be more subjective and to rely on feelings. So that's strike one against us to start with. A fool always loses his temper, but a wise man holds it back, Proverbs says. Number four, do not be accusatory. Using the word you, you always, you never. That implies blame or guilt on the part of the other. And they say you don't talk to anybody in conflict with a you shouldn't or you should because that's a parent to a child phrase. Rather use I, I feel, I would like. Number five, focus on the issue at hand and not on the character flaws of the other person or his or her past failings. Lady, ladies, love does not keep a list of wrongs. And it's so easy when I am in this conflict to somehow start bringing in all those other little conflicts that we've had before where they have failed. Because we know where the other person's hot buttons are. Do you know what that word means? I know just what to push to make them angry. And when we're trying to deal with conflict, we want to stay away from hot buttons. And this is not original to me. I footnoted it, and I can't remember where it's from. But I, I thought, Jeanette, this is what's going to help you the most. Aim for getting a response rather than a reaction. <laughs> 
A response is a purposeful, thoughtful process. A reaction is a retort that the speaker generally regrets. So aim for a response rather than a reaction. <laughs> and an online article I read said, when you argue for more than 10 minutes, you're probably not discussing the real conflict. <laughs> Think about that one. I think it's true. Six, be aware of your tone of voice and your body language because the person you're talking to will get more out of that than even the words you say. And that's why you should never handle a disagreement through email because email cannot give you tone of voice and body language. Hold your conversation in a neutral place with a soothing atmosphere and where you can discuss things in private. Stand or sit side by side if possible. One of the online articles I read says people are more likely to like each other, remember more of what they discuss, and agree when they sidle. Now not Lynn's kind of sidle, but sitting side by side. And have you ever noticed that when you walk and talk with someone, it's easier than standing face to face? This isn't how you want to settle a dispute. Find points of agreement and common ground. Do you share a common goal? Do you general, generally care, genuinely care about some of the same things? If nothing else, just express appreciation that they're trying to work with you on solving the problem. Assume you have something to learn. Assume there's a more creative solution than maybe you've thought of. That is a humble response, isn't it? Learn to compromise. And this next statement uh, discouraged me a little bit. Dr. John Gottman, in his research in managing conflict, says 69% of problems in a relationship are unsolvable. Now, how he knows it's 69% and why that number? <laughs> I don't know. <coughs> what do we do then? If 69% of conflicts are unsolvable, well, we're going to have to, com to compromise. If you will do this for me, I will do this for you. There are going to have to be concessions made. Be willing to call in a mediator if you can't resolve a dispute. Um, there are objective people out there who are not involved in that same conflict. They can give you some advice. Let go of your expectations. And I want to hit this one again. A minister officiating at a wedding prayed this prayer. Help this couple to give up their expectations. Expectations only hinder gratitude. Do you realize, ladies, that no one can hurt you? No one has the power to hurt you if you have no expectations. And one of the people said, when we expect too much from the people around us, it's often because we expect too little from God. The last thing, view conflict as a tool of God in your life. Don't look at the people that you're having a conflict with as being an adversary or an opponent. Can we look at them as an instrument that God is using right now in my life to chisel away hindrances to my Christ-likeness? 
My husband has on his shelf a book by Gary Thomas titled Sacred Marriage, and on the very front cover of his book, he asks this question. What if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? And I thought, oh, Lord, that's a good question to ask in any conflict. What if I'm in this? Because God has a design to make me holy. Ken Sandy says, peacemakers are people who breathe grace. They draw continually on the goodness and power of Christ. I'll let you read the rest of that paragraph. But they exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. As Christ did when he was so mistreated and suffered so, even on that little patch of his life that we concentrated on these two weeks, from the Garden of Gethsemane to the cross. I'd like to leave you this question. Ken Sandy asked it. What is the difference between the way you are handling conflict and the way a good atheist would handle it. I hope you've gained some insight today and some help from the scriptures, maybe to deal with some of the conflict you're facing right now. Let's pray. Lord, we again thank you for the good attention and these ladies who soak in and Try to make use of some of these things. Make it helpful. Lord, so often we confess we don't handle conflict well. But help us to use it as you're trying to use it, as an instrument in our lives to make us more Christ-like. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.